Let's say that a roll flow was streaming. Let's say that I'm so pro kicks, I see goals like Steven. I'm Caesar, not like salad rides, Ides march to heathens. You think I was zoom, boomed, and doomed for all kinds of reasons. Cause I'm talking to Francesco when you were walking to your Tesco business cases, leaving traces while my knuckles on your fresco. And Jeremy was spoken in class today, better than a better could ever be clever. He folds cash, that's pay. We coming to the end, better ended up my way. Want to find out more? Check out medium.com backslash data rocks. And I'm turning Tina like Mr. Bob Dabalina. What's good, my dude, Craig Box? Ugh. Ugh. Well, before we get started, just while some folks are arriving, uh, we can kind of introduce this for people if this is your, your first time here. This is the Data on Kubernetes Community uh, Weekly Meetup. And today, very, very excited as always to have two awesome panelists that are going to be sharing some great knowledge with us about, um, about data streaming and obviously a lot of other things that are going to go along with it. Um, but just before we get started, uh, I know last week was a really big week. We had our state of the state meetup with uh, four fantastic uh, panelists, all from different countries, which was super, super cool where we learned a lot. And last week we started a new tradition for our community where we believe it, as, as a community in, in sharing knowledge and giving our time and being very, very generous. And in addition to that, we think it's important to reach out to different organizations uh, around the world that are doing lots of things to incorporate different folks into the equation. Um, for, for purposes of diversity inclusion and also creating job opportunities. Uh, so last week we had the, the chance to, to make a $100 gift to Code 2040, which is dedicated to helping uh, African-American Latinx folks in the US uh, learn these kind of skills, have more role models in their communities to make these things more, more tangible, more accessible. And this week, very, very happy to be giving our first $100 uh, donation to uh, The Last Mile, a program that was started in um, San Quentin uh, prison in, in California, helping incarcerated folks learn the necessary skills um, to have more job possibilities, better job possibilities when they're, when they're released to make the transition um, into, into the job market by, by learning all things related to programming. So like I said, this is the first week where we're collaborating with them, but hoping that we can, we can do more stuff and, and possibly share knowledge through their program about all things related to, to data on Kubernetes. Um, so like I said, that's, that's what we got going on. For, for anybody else, I will be leaving a, a couple links that are very important um, for uh, specifically for the, the speakers that we have today. Um, they're both very, very active um, and very generous with their time. So we thank them for that. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce both uh, Jeremy and Francesco. If you could just say hi, say who you are, where you are, what's going on. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy. I, you can recognize the accent. I'm French. I come from a very nice place in the French Alps. And uh, I'm a, I have a software, by, uh, software engineering background. And I work for a company called Babylon Health uh, based in the UK. And uh, I'm a platform engineer uh, working on our data operations uh, and our data infrastructure. Uh, Francesco, you might want to go next. Very good. Yep. So talking about accent, um, Francesco, and I, I'm Italian, so also my accent is not ideal. And I'm principal software engineer at Nutmeg, which is a fintech in, uh, in London. Before Nutmeg, I was uh, at Babino Health uh, with Jeremy, and we built a lot of cool stuff around uh, Kafka and the, the data solution for Babino. Okay, perfect. So with that in mind, and, and with what we got with, uh, with what Jeremy's sharing on the screen, I think you can get a little bit of idea of some, some of their backgrounds. And one of the things that you may have seen in our meetup description is that Francesco puts it out there very openly that he is a Kafka addict. So we're going to have a couple of questions about that. Also, we want to know about how you both of you started working with Kubernetes. But I just have to ask a particular question. In the photo that we can see that Jeremy is sharing right now, we see two people doing cheers. Uh, Francesco, is that tattoo of yours? No, actually, that's Jeremy. I'm the guy on the other side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, Jeremy, I have you... to say, it's, it's a fake tattoo. Uh, it, those pictures are actually both coming from Kafka Summit, different Kafka Summits. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of a spoiler here. We're gonna talk a bit, a lot about Kafka. And I, I guess we can see we both, you know, kind of like uh, Sweet, Kafka yeah. and racing and uh, drinking beers, I guess. Yeah. But mostly well, there's, 
there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I guess could both of you explain a little bit about, you know, the first time that you got in contact with Kubernetes, how that experience was, you know, for a lot of folks out there, uh, we're talking to different people all the time. And for a lot of people, you know, this entry point of how do I start? Where do I start? What worked in your experience? Francesco, we can start with you. Yes. So I, I started using Kubernetes when Babylon started adopting Kubernetes, which if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about, uh, two and a half years ago or a bit more than two and a half years ago. So I wasn't really close to uh, Kubernetes given the setup that, that, that we had at Babylon, but I had to, to understand the, the basics to interact with Kubernetes from an in, uh, a software engineering point of view. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, we, we together with Jeremy, we tried to use as much as possible the, the, the Kubernetes functionalities to facilitate and automate and make cell service a lot of the things that we needed for our streaming platform but no spoiler we will going through all those details in this talk perfect and what about you jeremy um yeah I've, i guess my first uh, experience with, with with kubernetes was actually to in a previous company to break the monolith really uh so starting with a microservice architecture and actually uh willing to you know, get our hands dirty with uh, a platform that will, uh, well, containers only, will help us uh, deploy uh, in different environments. And actually, uh, as Francesco said, you know, uh, automate all of that and give the power back to, to the engineers, to the developers, uh, so that we could actually scale faster. Um, and then the, the story that, uh, you know, Francesco mentioned at Babylon, obviously, uh, when we joined, we were uh, joining a team that was deploying all those, I mean, a few microservices with Chef on uh, bare AC2 instances uh, behind a, a load balancer, and then, uh, you know, moving to our self-managed Kubernetes uh, clusters, which was not easy for the, the team in charge of that. And we got help from a, from a company here in the UK called Jetstack. And I guess that's where we started, you know, getting our hands dirty, uh, joining the, the Kubernetes uh, meetup in London, here in London, um, and getting involved in community and ended up uh, you know, at uh, KubeCon as well. All right, very, very good. And no coincidence that we just celebrated that. Jeremy, we already got a comment though. Uh, maybe you can uh, stop sharing your screen and we can see your video just for a second. We got a comment from uh, Natalie um, who uh, said that she she's a big fan of your t-shirt. Um, maybe you could comment on that a little bit too. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I work with Natalie. Uh, we, so, um, <laughs> no, no, it's yeah. a random, it's a random fan out there. Come on, we know. <laughs> the um, yeah, actually, that T-shirt is a, is an idea from one of our, our colleagues uh, last year. Actually, before going to QCon, I was also, also hosting the, the Kubernetes and the Docker meetups uh, at Babylon. So I love, we love uh, Kubernetes at Babylon because it really helped us, you know, deliver on our mission uh, on uh, delivering healthcare affordable. Uh, for everyone on earth. Um, and we, you know, I'm not an expert in, in Kubernetes, but uh, we like to just uh, share the love. Very, very good. Awesome, fantastic. Um, now I think uh, without further ado, we can jump more into this question um, for, your, for your next slide regarding uh, your love for, for Kafka. We've already seen that it goes so far as a tattoo, even though it might be temporary, um, but how, you know, I mean, how does one become uh, an Apache Kafka addict, what does that involve? Is it a healthy addiction? How are you dealing with it? Let us know. I would say that sometimes it's very healthy, sometimes it's not healthy, especially when things are broken and you have to debug it, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, I learned a lot thanks to, to Kafka and actually looking into the, the, the Kafka source code since four years now. Essentially, when I, when I started using Kafka, there was not very much out there or the, the documentation was not good as today. So often when you couldn't understand how, how things worked or why things were broken, you had to dig into the, the source code. And, and that's where the, 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 the spark started, actually. And we actually, uh, I started getting more knowledge and Honestly, all the jobs that I uh, got so far in, in London have been thanks to Kafka. Wow. So that, that, that's a very good reason to be, to be thankful for this technology that it's provided you with lots of different pathways into different areas. And in your experience, Jeremy? 
Yeah, I think uh, it's a good summary. I mean, uh, especially in terms of the you know the the market for for jobs, uh, Kafka. Both Francesco and I uh, brought us to to San Francisco to meet uh, really the people who developed the the you know, the technology uh, at LinkedIn first and uh, and now uh, at Confluent. Uh, we are also you know finding new tools every week uh, being developed around this technology. Now I was mentioning it's a fake tattoo. It's important to mention that you know it's just uh, I see Kafka as a technology. It's it, it can be replaced at any time. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. I I think. Um, but yeah, uh, the it's, it's yeah. It, I think if I can summarize uh, and you, you tell me if you, you agree, Francesco. I think the addiction uh, to Kafka became uh, you know a good thing after Kafka 2.0. Uh, before that, it was uh, it was not healthy. I think the 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 love also is related to the fact that it helped us simplifying a lot. Mm -hmm. So some technical challenges that we had really fit into the the, the Kafka patterns or the, the the Kafka usage, and we could rely on an amazing uh, ecosystem of tooling that was already out there, and it helped us focusing more on creating the business value mm -hmm. while being able to move data around as fast as possible, actually to move uh, messages around as fast as possible. Okay, very good. And just uh, one question that we got previously from someone in our community when saw that the meetup was gonna be coming, uh, wanted to know a little bit about uh, specifically using Kafka with a service mesh. Uh, Jeremy, maybe you wanna take that one? Um, yeah, so... Um... <sighs> Basically, uh, it's, it's a bit of a spoiler on our presentation, and you you, you see that in, in a few slides. Uh, but I think we see now great examples of uh, you know new architectures in the last few years where people use uh, service meshes such as uh, ICO, um and use the the, the proxy uh, pattern to actually again simplify uh, the access, the, the configuration for the connection to Kafka. Um, I personally, we, we, we are uh, users of ECO at Babylon. Uh, we don't use it yet. It's on our roadmap to use it with Kafka. Uh, that will simplify a lot of our connections uh, to, 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 uh, to this uh, infrastructure. And as I'm gonna mention it several times today, uh, we really want to keep it simple for engineers to, to work with Kafka. So really isolate uh, them and really get them to focus on their business domain, on their business logic. Um, but at Babylon, we already use uh, Istio uh, as a service mesh to guarantee, for instance, an uh, MTLS connection within our cluster. So why not doing it with uh, external connections indeed? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Francesco, uh, anything you would like to add before jumping into the, more into the presentation? It would be a spoiler. So. Okay, good. So uh, with no spoilers, let's go ahead. So, I mean, this is, you know, just for groundwork, obviously we're talking about streaming, we're talking by Zoom, we watch a lot of Netflix, but what do we mean when we say streaming? Yes, exactly. We're not talking about Netflix here. And we thought that was uh, worth it mentioning what uh, streaming means. So if we can go to the next slide. Essentially, there are several concepts, concepts around uh, streaming. We have uh, streaming itself, which is the... the the process of processing record by record data, which has been simultaneously generated by multiple sources. So, and there are already a lot of uh, information in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, sentence. So we are talking about processing data. We're talking about processing data based not on the, on the full data set, but just on a, on, a, on, a single, on a single record and all the records that we have seen previously. And all this data is generated by a uh, given number of sources, which could increase, decrease, it shouldn't be real, a problem. So going to the next slide, streaming data is data that has been generated continuously by those sources. So think about uh, um, an IoT device, streaming data about the, the temperature in, uh, in our room, or if you're wearing a, a wearable devices, a wearable device and you're running, the device is constantly streaming data about your heart rate, or it could be a medical device. So something that, that, has a that is generating a continuous flux of data. And going to the next slide, we, we can then talk about techniques that needs to be applied 
to process this data. Because as we mentioned before, when talking about streaming, we, we leave the idea of knowing the entire data set behind. So we have a, a delta of what would be the data set today, tomorrow, sorry, today. And every record is adding more information and we need to decide how to act on it. So techniques that work on a, on a full data set may not actually work on a, on a, on a, on a streaming approach. Which brings us to the, to the last thing, which is our streaming application, which is essentially something that is putting together all those things. So it's a piece of software that is an analyzing streaming data by applying streaming processing techniques. So why we thought it was important clarifying those points, because we will, we, we will talk about streaming application. And though this should give you an idea of what we will mean in the, in the, in the, in the next slides. So we, we, cre we created, we, we, we had in mind uh, a to-do list of what we need to define uh, a cube native, a cloud native streaming application. In the next slides, we will go through all those uh, things, all those items in our, in our to-do list, and we'll give you more details about each one in terms of not only technical challenges, but also, also a cultural fit. All right. With, with that in mind, um... Uh, you know, frequently, like, like we said in the beginning, uh, you know, I know that we're not talking about Netflix. We could be talking about medical devices, about an autonomous car, about lots of different things. Uh, frequently on the, the human side of, you know, maybe frustrations with things related to delays. Um, are, there, are there delays that can happen in these kinds of environments? Of course. I mean, as we said, it's a constant flow of data. And there could be a situation where there are just a few records. Moving, moving around in a specific point in time, or there might be other situation where this, the same exact application is facing a, a, a bigger load. And there are uh, technical approaches that can, can, can help you, or architectural solution that can help you to, to, to prepare, to get ready, to not have those delays, or have delays that you can, you can accept. So there is the idea of just scaling up your uh, streaming application, which could be as simple as bringing up the number of replicas in your Kubernetes uh, replica set, or having a, an, 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 an auto-scaling uh, so solution. Or you could reach actually a limit for the underlying streaming, um, streaming solution, which could be Kafka that you're using, which even though you, uh, you scale up the number of your, of your uh, replicas, it will not actually impact the lag which is this delay that we are, we are talking about. And in Kafka, for example, this concept is related to the partitions. So you have topic where you see data going through and the topic is split in multiple partitions. And the, the, the partition, the number of partition, partitions is the, the unit of parallelization in Kafka. So if you're consuming from one topic and that topic has four partitions, you cannot have five replicas reading from, from that topic or better. You can have five replicas reading from that topic, but one of them will be idle. Four of them, four of them will consume data, each one from a different partition, and then the fifth one will be, will be waiting, uh, waiting for uh, actually getting access to one of the partition when one of the other four will, will go offline. So there are multiple, uh, multiple places and multiple approaches to make sure that the, the lag is not a problem, but it's, it's for sure something to take into account when you design a, a streaming solution. Very good. And Jeremy, uh, one other question just to follow up. Um, how can you keep the record based on what part of the queue you're in? Um, well, uh, based, I guess you are yeah, referring to what Francesco was talking about with the partitions and mm -hmm. uh, potentially using, uh, I mean, actually it's, it's a good question for, for Francesco. Uh, I think you gave a talk about that last year. <laughs> no, no problem that we can have, uh, we can but, have uh, him jump in if you need help. Yeah. Using a, a custom partitioner basically and using a potentially a, you know, Kafka message keys to uh, define where you're gonna store all those messages, uh, those records in which partition uh, and yeah, partition them together. Um, so that's, uh, the unit of prioritization, as uh, Francesco mentioned, and basically to find those records 
uh, they are actually uh, Kafka is a is a log is basically an append only log. So uh, the the pointers to each of the records are just offsets which are incrementing all the time. We'll we we'll talk about that uh, in in the coming slides as well. But sometimes something you need to do you need to point to a specific point in the log or point in time. Essentially, you you, you can see the offset as a, as an index in an array in a very simplified way. And you store, you keep track of that index somewhere. So for example, talking about Kafka, there is a, 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 a specific topic where consumers are storing the last committed offset. So the last, the last of the offset till which the consumer has analyzed all the data successfully. Other streaming platform uh, uses different approaches. Also in Kafka, there are uh, applications that use an, an external storage for this information. But essentially, the, 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 key, the key point here is that there is an index telling you where you are. And in order to not lose that information, you need to store it somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. Very, very good. All right. Let's keep moving. Um, let's get into the next thing. Let's look at the, the diagrams and how you break this down. Yeah, so basically we thought, you know, this is all nice as the theory. Um, let's pick one very basic use case that both Francesco and I uh, met very often uh, in both our, our jobs. Um, and as you just mentioned, you know, we're going to focus on a stream application. So that's uh, this, uh, this block in purple here on the screen. I'm going to try as much as we can to keep our developers uh, to only focus on the items which are purple on this diagram here. And, you know, abstract them from the rest. So we can see a diverse source of data uh, in a microservice architecture here on the diagram, different microservices, all streaming business events. So each of those services uh, is owned by a different team potentially, which owns a, a business domain. Uh, so it could be our registration team. It could be a team looking after our chatbot. And they are responsible for those events that they send through to the rest of uh, the, the architecture, the, the rest of the system really, then different services. And in our case, to stream this data and help us process it uh, further, we picked Kafka in our example. Um, and the, the goal of this streaming app really is to uh, aggregate and process and stream further downstream uh, this, uh, those, this bunch of events basically that could serve different uh, use cases downstream. Uh, could be a projection for a search engine, or it could be another service consuming this, those events to react to them, or it could be for analytics purposes or uh, machine learning for instance. Um, so I hope it's clear. We're gonna focus on my stream app in the middle and what we need to uh, figure out here, as uh, Francesco mentioned, this to-do list. First of all, we'll talk about uh, how we need to package this application to help us uh, deploy it and uh, maintain it uh, easily at scale. Uh, we are gonna talk about how to measure the health of our application, how to measure the performance of our application, and then basically uh, based on those metrics, uh, we're gonna talk about how to uh, maintain the application in a production environment. At some point, we're going to have to talk about the infrastructure this application is running on and potentially how we configure this infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we'll also talk about how we uh, deploy uh, this application at the same time. And finally, we'll talk about how using cloud native solutions and this, this platform we're going to describe, uh, this, this entire ecosystem can help us manage the resources uh, on the Kafka side and on the streaming uh, topology side to help us uh, manage this application. And potentially, you know, in both our jobs uh, with, with Francesco, we have this use case replicated thousands, you know, hundreds of times. And uh, it's not actually our job to run and develop those, uh, those applications anymore, but we support the teams who are uh, empowered to do so. So first item, Francesco. Good. <laughs> yes, so we are Back to the to the list that we're talking that, we, that I mentioned before, and we are the Kubernetes data on Kubernetes meetup. So talking about containers should not be a surprise, but we don't want to focus only on the on the Docker aspect of uh, those containers. We all know that uh, a pod is a set of uh, Docker images that we are a set of containers that we are running. 
we have a Docker image. But the, the advantage that we, 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 we found is that you can standardize a lot on how those Docker images are built. So if we consider two different uh, streaming ap application, one could be de uh, deployed for use case A, another one could be deployed for use case B. But if you take a look, essentially they are uh, an external, they have an external box, which is about connecting with the, with the streaming infrastructure or provisioning something or being able to expose the metrics that Jeremy was mentioning before, being able to expose uh, props, in, props information uh, that, that we mentioned before. And then inside, you have the actual business logic. So talking about a situation where you're running, let's say a thousand different streaming application, there is a thousand times something that has been replicated across all of them. And this is something that you can achieve with having a common container and having also a common repo, a, a, temp, a GitHub template, for example, to build those application. In this way, you can keep those common logic in a, in a single place and reuse it as much as possible. By doing that, you will probably also have a library that is helping you to build this template. So the base Docker image plus the library should also make it easier to, to, to control what version, for example, of the uh, underlying clients to connect to Kafka in our, in our use case you're using. Or you can, uh, you can, you can have a, 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 a way to, to, to simply update a lot of streaming applications without asking every team to, to think about the specific feature that now you want to support. There is a central team that could be like a, a, an internal open source community. You can see this thing like multiple people working on a common, a common repo to build this, this common library, which is essentially wearing up and building all the boilerplates that you need. In this way, each team is only focusing on business value. So going to the next slide, we talk about uh, probes. So again, data on Kubernetes, this should not be a surprise. And we know that there are different types of probes that uh, Kubernetes is, is offering to us. When we have a streaming application, we mentioned before the idea of consuming something and doing something with, with, with this data, which could be consuming, consuming, transforming it, and output this data on a different topic in the example of Kafka, or consuming this data from Kafka and writing it in a, in a, in a, in a different storage. But sometimes there are situations where you're not only consuming this data and mapping this data or transforming this data, but you're applying a transformation that has a state associated with it. A very simple example is, think about a streaming that is giving you uh, all the click events on a, on a page. And you want to count uh, how many, how many connections you have received from a specific country. So you consume that data, you will probably aggregate it according to some IP or some other, some other rules that, that, you, that, that you have, and then you start counting. In the moment that you start counting, you're building a state. So you know that before that record, you had N minus one click. And you need to store this state somewhere. So talking about Kafka, for example, and Kafka streams, you, store this, uh, you can store this, uh, this state in something called RocksDB which is an in-memory database, the Kafka stream is automatically backing up into a Kafka topic. But now think about when you restart your application. When you restart your application, you don't want to forget about all the clicks that you have analyzed before. You want to consume the, the state that you had before redeploying your application and then starting consuming, which brings us to two different steps in the life of a streaming application. You have the liveness of the application, which is related to the fact, can I consume data? Can I output my data? So for example, can I connect to Kafka? But then we said that the application will be 
working or being ac actively uh, consuming this data or analyzing this data when the previous state is still there. And that's where the, the, the readiness kicks in, which is regarding the state. The, 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 the readiness check to, should, should tell us I'm, I'm, I'm ready only when the state has been read from, from Kafka and now you can really start consuming this data. So this is a, 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 a very important concept because thinking about uh, um, how deploys, uh, the, the deployments work, you may have the situation where you have uh, one instance running, the old one with let's say two replicas, you bring down one of the old, you bring up the, the new one. Let's say that we don't have the readiness one, we just have the liveness. That instance is reporting healthy. So we bring down the last old one, we bring back, we bring up the second new one, everything is healthy, fine. But then we have a state that is a few gigs, 100 gigs, and it may take a few seconds or it could take a good hour to load. So although your application is, is connected to, to Kafka, you're live, but you're not consuming this data. That's, that's how uh, these two different probes can, can, can help you. And talking about streaming, you should think about it. There are situations where having these uh, two probes could be just a, a technical overhead, and you may think that it's not really useful. But at scale, with a lot of data, they really make a difference. So going to the next slide. Yeah, I'll take over here. So Francesco talked about how we package our application, how we measure its health. Is it ready? Is it uh, live? Uh, is the pod ready to stream? Uh, now let's talk about how to measure the performance. Um, so here is a diagram. It's, it's a bit complex, but actually I'm going to go fast. And you, you, get, you can see on the right, there's a list of uh, logos of nice uh, you know, cloud native uh, foundation projects. Um, this is one example, just to show you know, uh, what technology, what, what solution you can use, but obviously there are other alternatives for, for each of those. Uh, so we can find again our uh, application in the middle, now uh, consuming events, uh, potentially uh, streaming events from, uh, from Kafka. And the question we need to ask is, what do we need to measure uh, on, on this application. So we need to have metrics from the app itself, potentially it's an app package in, you know, written in Java, in Scala, in Python. So we need to expose metrics uh, for the, the performance and health of this app. We need, and that's back to your question earlier uh, about the, the position in the queue. We need to also keep an eye on the consumer offset. So how much did we already read from the queue? Uh, where are we positioned? Uh, what's, what's our consumer offset? And to do that, here I mentioned just one example of a, a solution. It's a small open source project called Kafka Minion. Uh, we can see it's in uh, light blue, meaning we deploy it on Kubernetes, uh, just like the rest of our uh, infra, you know, rest of our services and tools. And then basically to expose uh, the, the metrics and uh, yeah, the performance of our infrastructure, Kafka itself, the, the backend uh, for the streaming platform. Uh, we also gonna use um, the same solutions as for the, the application and for Kafka Minion. We're gonna use some uh, Prometheus exporters. Uh, so here we can see on the diagram that we are using the, the, pretty much the same solution everywhere. It's all streaming to uh, Prometheus infrastructure also deployed on Kubernetes. Prometheus will pass, uh, so the, th those metrics, you know, a lot of those metrics are, are coming uh, and you only need a few of them. So we need to set up some rules to pass those metrics and pass it further up for consumption by the end users, uh, potentially with something like Grafana. Now, at the bottom of the diagram, we can see two files. We can see a manifest. Um, which is basically uh, the way we're going to let our engineers write a very basic skeleton, potentially in YAML or in JSON, skeleton of uh, what their app uh, and the configuration of their app should be, so the desired state really. And we have an extra layer uh, of, um, of CI CD, which will basically uh, template all of that and um, push the, the desired state to, uh, to Kubernetes in our case. Um, 
in the same manner, basically, we, we use also some, some YAML configuration to deploy and to configure Prometheus, for example. I just mentioned we need to parse those metrics in a specific way. We need to configure um, those, those parser, those rules. And we also want to follow, just like with the manifest, the GitOps approach where we, all of the changes are auditable. We push that to the CICD and then it deploys. For that, we could use something like Flux, uh, for example. Um, so here, the real idea is to really simplify and standardize the, um, you know, some templates for engineers to just reuse uh, to guarantee that as soon as they deploy their application, they get all the metrics they need to measure their performance, the performance of the backend they use. On the right-hand side, we can see an example of, uh, you know, the, the Kafka Minion tool I, I mentioned. Uh, so that's something available for any of our engineers to manage the consumer of set to actually uh, you know, follow their application and see how, is it lagging? Uh, is it basically a bit too, uh, too far in the queue, which could show a problem in, in performance, for example. Oh, and if I can stop you here really quickly, uh, Jeremy, we got a question from someone in the audience. Um, can we take metrics based on the message content? For example, how many messages of each version do we have? Um, so that's a good, uh, yeah, that's a good question because uh, the small point is icon next to the, the stream app. I think, you know, that, that really shows we, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Francesco, but you could really implement whatever metrics exposure you want in your application uh, in Java using micrometer or something like that. You, uh, maybe using interceptors, I don't know. You, you could write something that does that. Is it, is it performant? Is it, is it a good idea to do that within your application? I, uh, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would say you can expose yeah whatever, whatever counts, whatever counter you want yeah from from within the app. We, uh, Francesco, can you think of examples uh, where we've been writing very custom, custom so counters? In, in the in the past, we had uh, an example of a streaming application that was just optimized to count different versions of. Uh, specific schema, but it was more like a, a, um, a test or something to, 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 to try something out. Uh, in my mind, I don't have a real example where I have done something like that. But one suggestion is if you implement a, a, custom, a custom counter for your streaming application, for example, talking about, uh, um, let's say, that's uh, what you're asking. You want to count different uh, how how many messages you have seen for each specific version of your of your schema, and you're using, for example, Kafka Stream. Think about that. You have the notion of committing the offset that we mentioned before. So if you haven't committed that offset, every message for which you haven't committed that offset can be potentially read multiple times. Of course, talking about Kafka, you can enable exactly once and you can prevent this thing. But when you're streaming data, think about possible situation where a redeploy or a restart or a, a, a temporary issue with something could trigger a, a something that will force you to read again that, that message. Therefore, your metric could be a bit off. Very good. And, and one other question to ask as well uh, regarding tooling. I know, Jeremy, you mentioned quite quickly. Um, how did you arrive at this tooling setup? Or are there other tooling setups that you may have seen that other folks out there might be using? Um, yeah, again, that's, that's just one example. Uh, I, I think that's actually the case of, oh, again, it's the data on Kubernetes uh, meetup. So we thought it was a good idea to mention uh, those projects. But uh, if you are running on managed Kafka, for instance, on MSK uh, at AWS, you, you, you would actually benefit from CloudWatch to do a, something similar. Uh, some people might actually use agent-based uh, metrics. Uh, I don't know, New Relic, uh, Datadog, they, they are actually really good with Kafka as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all, at least on the Kafka side, which you know, it's, it's actually the, the other side uh, going out of the, the discussion around the, the application itself. It's all based on, on JMX at the end, really, um, at least for the Kafka side. And then I mentioned the node exporter. It's really to give a data about your underlying infrastructure. So again, if you're in the cloud, something like CloudWatch would help. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh, here for us, it worked pretty well because uh, this diagram you can see here, and I think it's important to mention it for the, the next slides. Um, you can imagine we have this pink box 300 times in at least 15 environments and counting. So we needed a, a way to deploy those things quickly all together again uh, in, in those diagrams, the, the blue boxes, the light blue boxes mean it's actually deployed on Kubernetes in the same environment. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, I'll move on then. Um, we talked about the performance um, and let's talk about uh, how we get alerted. So let's say we deploy this thing in production or non-production, it doesn't really matter. And we want to know, we want to be able to maintain this thing. Uh, so very similar uh, stack, obviously. Um, I'm going to mention Alert Manager, Prometheus Alert Manager. So with the same infrastructure, we're going to benefit from uh, those metrics. Uh, we're going to set alerts, um, which are templated the same way I mentioned earlier with uh, this uh, central configuration with a GitOps approach. And uh, as, as we talked about it at the beginning with Francesco, the idea is to simplify and also bring a template unified across the, across the company. Um, so when it comes to you know, alerting on the backend infrastructure, Kafka, on potentially the consumer like So everything related to Kafka, we really want to simplify it to democratize uh, the, you know, the, the access to Kafka for engineers. And um, we can set a, some rules and some, some alerts, some thresholds, which are common for all of our Kafka clients at, at, at Babylon or at NetMeg. Um, so I think it's important, you know, to, to see here the, this, this black uh, config file as, one set of alerts and rules which are set by maybe the team uh, owning uh, the, the Kafka infrastructure. And then I would recommend uh, each of the teams, we talked about domain owners, so each of the team developing this, uh, this pink uh, stream app in the middle to develop their own domain oriented alerts. So if you talk about IoT, for instance, you know, we, we, we maybe the aggregation itself, uh, the, this transformation you do in your, in your stream topology, maybe you want to measure something very specific here. And uh, as the question uh, was asked before, you wrote your own uh, exposure uh, of metrics and you want to write your own alerts. Um, so this stack is relying on Prometheus, uh, pushing the alerts further to an incident management uh, team or tool. And I mentioned a few of those here. Um, and yeah, I think that's all. Uh, what I wanted to mention on just one little quick question about that: Why, why the Prometheus alerts and not Grafana alerts? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, honestly, we 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 we've been using both. We've been playing with both. Um, but back then, you know, the Grafana alerts were a bit less uh, performance. Uh, we tend to use Prometheus because it's uh, it's H, it's highly available. Um, we, we actually noticed that the, you know, the alerts on Grafana were not really scalable. Uh, the, the templating here I mentioned is very important for us. We write the alert once, we deploy it to thousands of environments uh, because the, the same rule applies in most of them. And then the threshold could be actually customized in the values in, in this manifest. Um, uh, another another thing with Grafana, you know, it's, it's basically at least in our stack, uh, it, it's consuming from um, it's consuming uh, Prometheus uh, metrics, so it's one more layer uh, where you know you, something could actually happen in between Prometheus and Grafana. So I'd rather just uh, set the, the rules on, on the on the Prometheus side. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess both both are doable. It, yeah, uh, the maybe maybe people don't really like the Prometheus uh, syntax. Um, but for us, it, it, it works pretty well. Uh, yeah, and we actually have... just got a comment in the chat saying from Sandeep, thank you, Sandeep, saying it's easy to manage and reuse the alert template in different environments in Prometheus. So I think that's kind of an answer right there too, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, that's the main, you know, that's, that's the main reason why we picked it. So something to take in, into account is that, uh, as we said before, we, we try to standardize as much as possible all the boilerplates. And the the, uh, pro, the the alert manager was fitting better the use case compared with the Grafana dashboard. Perfect. It was it was way more granular than a, a, an old dashboard with a lot of different things where different domains or different teams can 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 monitor uh, their stuff in a in a different approach. And we just While got a, no sorry go an ahead. Alert, yeah. An alert is just one alert, one thing, much more scalable. 
Mm -hmm. And we just got another comment confirming what you guys are saying that uh, from Nabil that in Prometheus hooks directly to our alert manager. So once again, making it more and more convenient uh, for that kind of visibility. Good. Awesome. So next on our to-do list is the infrastructure. It's actually the, the biggest part of this presentation, really. Um, uh, I'm going to try to go fast, but basically configuring your secure Kafka client can be complex. And actually, it should be, we think it should be easy for, for engineers to do so, or it should be abstracted completely. They shouldn't even care about that. They shouldn't care about the plumbing, really focus on their domain logic. So uh, if you try to uh, deploy in a normal environment your, your Kafka stream app for the first time, you need to care to take care of a, a few things. First of all, you need to figure out which infrastructure you're targeting. So potentially DNS records, what are my, what we call uh, bootstrap servers in the Kafka world. Um, you need to think about how my connection to that backend is encrypted. How do I authenticate? And how do I manage the, the access control, the permissions, what we call the ACLs. So Really, that's, that's a lot. And as we've seen in the, in the last few years with Francesco, uh, it did take a lot of time on our teams to basically figure that out. And it's very error prone, obviously. Uh, so we thought, can we make that simpler and maybe introduce uh, you know, the sidecar uh, container pattern where this common sidecar here, we would pre-build it and we would make it configurable so that any of our teams, any of our engineers, when they deploy their pink application here, they don't need to care about the, the layer on top. Uh, so the connection is handled for them um, and uh, the configuration of Huli as well. Now we can see it's still in red. We, we can see the, the user at the top on the Kafka side is still in red. There's a question, okay, who created the user and the user credentials on Kafka? So still, still actually on, the, on my engineer's uh, plate and, and same with the, the certificates uh, for, for encryption authentication. So, it's not perfect, but that brings us back to the, your, your question at the beginning, I believe, regarding service mesh. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see about that. Um, now, we need to, be, uh, to go a, a bit further. So we decided to uh, try and deploy an operator. Um, and we picked StreamZ, again, a CNCF uh, project. Um, and here we can see at the bottom our manifest. That's our uh, YAML skeleton for developers to easily uh, you know, write a configuration and deploy their application. And we thought, why not uh, bundling it together with the configuration of the required infrastructure? The idea behind that is uh, when you deploy a service, really the infrastructure which, which is required for, for that app should also, we should be deployed and should be ready when, uh, when you push it. Um, so we have a set of templated, we, we use Helm in this case, templated charts which not only provide a, a simple way to deploy the application on one side, but also uh, trigger the creation of the, the required infrastructure and the different resources in a specific domain, in our case, Kafka. So StreamZ uh, can be deployed in many ways. We, we won't talk too much about that uh, today, but uh, here the, the example of the user operator can is using the operator pattern and in Kubernetes, and um, it can be deployed uh, standalone. As we can see now, it's being triggered by a Kafka user. So we see an object of type Kafka user. And here I'm gonna just introduce or you know, mention the, the CRD, uh, the, the concept of this uh, custom resource uh, definition. When you install the StreamZ user operator, it's gonna install, you're gonna install a, a CRD and this, uh, this new type in your Kubernetes cluster of object for Kafka users. So as we understand here, our manifest basic YAML will push further the app and uh, declare a new user. What's interesting here is that we can predefine things like naming convention of the user, which is gonna be important later to allow uh, easy permissioning and management of those streams. Um, now, when this object is being created, it will trigger uh, the, the operator, which itself will now manage the, the generation of uh, secrets and credentials for, for our application, which are passed directly mounted to our proxy. So really at this point, our uh, application, our, our engineer only focuses on the, on the application, on the, the pink box in there. Um, we can potentially go a bit further. Uh, again, a CRD at the end of the day, you know, it's custom, so you could create your own. And uh, we thought, Sorry. 
I just need to mention one thing before I go, I go too fast. Uh, you, you might ask, uh, there are different types of resources in Kafka. You need to care about the users and you need to care about the topics. Um, so we talked about the topics at the beginning of the talk. Uh, managing the topics is also, well, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the game here. You need this topic to be existing on your backend. You need to, to be configured. You need, to, you need the user to have uh, access to it and you need to ma manage those permissions. So same idea, same diagram. Based on the manifest, one PR to our uh, well, GitOps pipeline, and this will push the service, but also the topic and the permission, meaning that actually when your service or when your pod starts, it already has everything it needs. Um, and here we can see the diagram. Um, so we can see this new CRD, also installed by the Streams operator for the Kafka topic. And we can define uh, a few configurations in there. You can define there's the concept of retention in the topic. How, for how long do you keep the data in this log of app and only, uh, you know, log of messages? Um, so that's something you can configure. Uh, there's the replication factor. Kafka, by nature, you know, you want it to be HA, uh, highly available, so, and replicated. So those are things you want to configure and you might want to even enforce and set a template for all of our applications to be deployed using the same type of topics uh, that will be useful for Kafka streams, but that also, you know, just for actually managing Kafka itself and making sure that nobody is creating an app where their topic is using replication factor one. And potentially when you have an operation in production, uh, replacing some, some machines, you're gonna actually uh, have an offline partition. Um, so that's one thing we, we, we've done. Um, now, as I said, we can go a bit further. A CRD is just something you can also uh, create yourself. And the team had this idea to basically define a wrapper uh, custom resource that we would call an event stream, which predefines some of those uh, values. So the retention, the replication factor, the number of partition in a topic. And as we can see in the diagram here, uh, we deployed our application in, in pink and we can see it seems to be consuming from a topic and we have an, another service in our architecture which is producing events in there. Uh, all of that can be written somewhere in the manifest and can be managed in the Kubernetes state in a CRD. And that will help us in the future potentially to manage better this, you know, potentially this, this set of applications. We, we're gonna deploy a lot of them. It's gonna become really, really complex to manage in one environment. And if we deploy it to several, it's, it's really a mess. So as an engineer, as a developer, I, uh, we were able to abstract completely the, the, the concepts, you know, the Kafka concepts uh, for our engineers. We can focus on the domain logic, but they can still access uh, this data very quickly. So using the, the cube uh, control uh, command, uh, we can, for instance, access direct, directly a list of our uh, CRDs for the Kafka user itself. Here we can see uh, different users that have been automatically created based on our manifest. So each developer created a service it created the user, it's available in the in the, the tube state. And if we were to describe those users, we would see the permission it has and how it's configured. You can do the same with topics, uh, same idea. You'll get uh, the configuration. We can see the naming convention here seems to be set already with uh, maybe a type event, uh, the name of a domain, for example, and the, the type of the, the entity really. Uh, but also you could, you could let your engineers de de deploy their own topic. It doesn't, uh, at the end of the day, a Kafka topic, you know, you can configure it uh, however you, you want. And as we talked about the wrapper, it's this idea of really enforcing a bit more uh, governance on the, those configurations. So you can use, uh, you can list the CRDs, uh, the, the custom resources in there. And we can find, you know, this event domain a registration event stream is itself a Kafka topic. So the operator or streams operator will detect that and will deploy it automatically to Kafka. But we can see also our developers were able to uh, write in their manifest what, like, what consumes, what produces uh, to its stream. And this will be important for the, the next slide. Oh, can we just actually go back to the, the last slide because we had a very important question, very conflictive, yeah. very controversial. How do you pronounce cube CTL? Yeah, so <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> um, I guess uh, back home we say uh, cube CTL, um, uh, but yeah, I, I guess the right way is cube control. 
but I think I hear everyone at, at work seeing a cube uh, cube CTL. Okay. And, and Francesco, in Italy or in your experience, uh, I would say cube CTL is the is the most used, and then you can have a a, a, a diversion according to the to the accent. <laughs> and also because uh, last week in KubeCon scene in in the hallway uh in the hallway slack uh all these different ways of saying cube cuddle cube control and then as jeremy rightfully pointed out depending on what country you're in that might dictate as well anyway just throw that in there but before we move to the, to the next slide uh i think there is one more uh, thing that we can that we can add regarding the the developer that jeremy mentioned mentioned before so this, this idea of having a, a um a custom crt that we are adding in the in the in our cube cluster and the other important aspect, aspect of, of this extra CRT that we are uh, creating in this case is that it will help us defining some standards and proxying towards open source tools that we can just reuse. So when, when, when we created the, the, the CRT, we had some specific logic that made a lot of sense for uh, our specific Pavilion use case. And what we wanted to do was not reinventing something like Streamsy, which is very complex and Streamsy is doing a much better job than what we could do. So the idea was having this custom solution, do I have a way to reuse those information and create all the rest? So in, in few lines of code, essentially, you can, you can have a lot of powerful in terms of custom solution and enabling an open source tool to achieve what you need in terms of provisioning infrastructure. And this, this thing is connected to the last item in our to-do list, which is data lineage. So we're talking about a streaming application. So we're talking about data. And we said that there are a lot of different sources at the beginning producing this data. And at scale, there will be a lot of different uh, stream applications consuming this data. And one of the questions that I often uh, received was, yeah, but who is actually consuming my data? So like I have service A, service A is publishing in the stream alpha, but then who, how can I know that there is stream uh, service two and service one on the other side of the world consuming the, this data? And what we thought is that, look, we have ACLs to control who, who can access what, because by default, every, everything is, is locked down. And what we realized is that an ACL is not just something to configure uh, authorization on a resource, but it, it, is, it is also metadata about your platform. And trying to abstract this idea, we realized that in several places there were there, there were code yaml actually talking about kubernetes that was used to interact with the infrastructure that could be actually used to expose metadata about the streaming application and made in such a way that those information had to be there otherwise you were not able to produce this data for example the acls you were not able to consume this data, ACLs again, but you need to define the, 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 the stream and the stream had to comply with some standard. If you were not complying, you couldn't create the topic. We could uh, template some of the uh, most uh, crucial uh, settings for, for the topics and prevent, for example, data loss. Or uh, we could provide a specific uh, 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 configuration regarding the schema that we were using for the key and the value in this case for the Kafka message, as Jeremy was mentioning before. All this information together provided a very good base to build something that we called uh, event stream registry, which, which is essentially the graph of our streaming, uh, of, of, of our streaming ar architecture. And it's a graph based in such a way that you don't need to be a, a, a Kafka hardcore uh, engineer to understand it. Because one of the requirements that we had is talking about the data lineage, there could be a, a product manager that is interested in exploring how the data produced by um, uh, his or her service is used, or a product manager that, that is thinking about a new feature and 
he or she wants to discover what kind of data is currently uh, available or an analyst that is uh, building some, some new reporting and he needs to under, understand a bit more uh, uh, about this data. And this thing also helped us to enforce the version of the schema because potentially given this, this structure, you could define uh, that you don't want to accept schema older than a specific version, which is a functionality that, that, that we needed and we, we, we couldn't find in other places. But the, the key message here is that often there are a lot of information that are only considered or analyzed, used with only one point of view. And there might be other way of using the same information and pro actually provide a lot of value for the entire company, not just the, 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 the engineering team. So everything that we have mentioned so far, it's a list of things that we, we, we put in place to make sure that each team was only focusing on business value and not recreating the same thing over and over and over. So this is our, our, our uh, recipe. For sure that uh, there are other alternatives to, to, to fit this use case. And honestly, I would love to hear about other, other solutions because there is always uh, something to learn. So if you have a different approach, get in touch, I will be more than, we will be more than happy to, to discuss about it. Perfect. I think that's, that's a really, really good way to finish is an invitation for people to ask questions. And from actually Francesco, from listening to other interviews with you, one of the things you talked about is how it's really important to do exactly that, is to reach out to other people and ask questions. Don't be afraid. People like being asked questions. I want to ask the two of you, what are questions that you frequently receive from other folks out there in the community? So that's a very interesting question. And I think it depends on the context where you are. So like we, uh, we gave uh, a few talks at the, at, the, at the Kafka meetup or the Kafka summit, and then questions were really related to, to the Kafka domain. Then on, uh, online, people reached out about uh, other, other uh, open source things that we're doing or, or blogs that we, that we wrote. Uh, Anyone doing our job, I think, loves answering questions or discussing about what he's doing or she's doing. So it's a big variety of, of questions. Like another question that is not technical is like, are you hiring? Yes, we are hiring. So it, it, it really de depends. I, I, I think, you know, the, um, one of the questions we had often is like, it's more related to the, the, the business itself. How do you go that fast? How, like, how from like a tiny team, we, we brought this idea of data operations and, and, and a platform for, for data integration. How did it scale that fast? And the idea was always like, okay, let's try to democratize, you know, the access to this piece of technology, Kafka. If you, if you read about Kafka, actually it's very similar to Kubernetes, you know, the, the opinion of, <laughs> You know the the tech people out there. It's just oh yeah, it, it's 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 a good piece of tech, but it could be a bit complex to work with. So really, only use if you need to. Uh, same with Kubernetes. And again, I, I should mention that everything we we, we 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 talked about today wouldn't have been possible without having also a great orchestration team at Babylon who built. Um, you know, at, at the end we are just especially in data operation, we are stealing the some of the principles of the the DevOps. Uh, <laughs> Uh, community and um, we apply that to uh, data engineering to to our pipelines and in this case to the way we manage the infrastructure and we manage deployment of those um, of those applications so uh, yeah limiting the complexity uh, allowing the de democratization uh, I guess that's what people were, were asking and then you know uh, yeah did you open source can you have you open source already this solution uh, and in this case you know the, the templating engine uh, i mentioned several times i think i need to mention it uh, it's it's uh, it's open source it's called shipcat uh, and you can find it online on github 
Okay, perfect. Just, I think, just, sorry, but just in case I forget as well, too, I want to put in the chat so everyone can see uh, the blog that both of you um, are a part of called Data Rocks. Um, so everyone can take a look at that because there's constantly new information coming out there, whether writing articles or editing articles. It's definitely a good place. If you want to stay in touch with uh, both Francesco and Jeremy, it's a good way to do it. Sorry, Francesco, what were you going to say? I was about to, to say is that... Uh, so there are a lot of questions that you can receive when talking into a, a, a public uh, audience, but there are also uh, very interesting questions when you talk with your with your colleagues. And something that we 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 try to do as much as possible was sharing knowledge and making sure that the the template that we were building, the the, the cookie cutter that we were building, was reducing the the knowledge barrier to start using our streaming platform. And essentially we were building a product for engineers. So interacting with those engineers was really, really useful. And in most of the cases, it was the other way around. We were asking questions to them to understand what was the challenge? What was making the actual uh, adoption, let's say slow, or it was making, making it more complex than what it, it should have been. And thanks to, to this constant feedback loop that we managed to, to, to achieve a, a, a solution that started delivering value. So it's not perfect as anything in the engineering world, there is always a tunnel space to, to improvement. But if, you, if you're building something like that, I strongly suggest to, to talk with the, the engineers around you and make sure that engineers are part of the, part of, of the journey as soon as possible. Something, something that we mentioned in a, in a different podcast that was related to my time at, at Babylon is that one of the mistakes that we did was involving engineers, involving the, 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 the Babylon engineers a bit too late. So there was a team that knew a lot about Kafka that was loving Kafka a lot. Some of them got addiction to Kafka, but then there was a massive knowledge gap with the, with the, with the rest. And it took quite a bit of time to close that gap. While if you make sure that everyone is around you is part of the, of the journey, obviously uh, on a different speed, but it's constantly part of the journey, this problem will hopefully should not be there. Very good, great points. And just to finish up, uh, you know, as we're finally getting to the close of 2020, and I think everyone's very excited for this year to be, to be coming to an end, what things do you anticipate will be happening next year in, in the Kubernetes world, in the Kubernetes community, whether it's related to data streaming or anything else? What do you think is going to be happening? Uh, Jeremy, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I don't know if we can predict. I don't like to predict, but I can, I can tell you what we would like to, to see happening mm -hmm. or what, what we're going to focus our, our work on. Um, I, I see, you know, adoption of, or I, at least some, some demand for uh, going further on Kubernetes with, with serverless potentially. So those new platforms uh, such as Kubeless or Fission uh, to make it even more efficient. And that's something we are actually looking at uh, at Babylon too, uh, making it more maybe cost efficient as well. And uh, we, we, we talked about this container, we package, you know, you, you have a template. Is it, it's one one size fits all. Uh, you, you need to actually go a bit further there, so and, and manage your your workload better. Um, ephemeral Kubernetes clusters. Uh, that's something we are interested in. Actually, like uh, it's in the same idea, managing your, your the cost of your infrastructure and being able to, as I just showed in the diagrams, everything is written. Everything is actually driven from the desired state in this manifest. Uh, so there's obviously the Kubernetes platform to be deployed, but why not? Why aren't we able to deploy that entire thing in 20 minutes, run the test, and then kill it? Uh, the report and then kill it. So that's another thing we 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 want to to have a look at. I think in the coming year, it's already it's not a, you know it's not a prediction. It's already a big thing. But uh, using OPA, so the, the Open Policy Agent, is also a big thing. It's something we talked about ACLs here for Kafka. Uh, it's very specific to Kafka. And then you have permissions for your application itself, and then you, you might have you know different different layers of uh, authorization. Like why not actually using one single uh, syntax and way to manage this uh, all these things, potentially with state on Kubernetes. That's you know it, it follows the same idea of uh, at least uh, at Babylon. What we've done is trying to put as much as we can the, the configuration in the, in the cube state. And uh, one last thing. Uh, 
we, we talked, uh, Francesco just mentioned, you know, the, the, what people come to, to ask to you. And they, one big question is always like, where is my data? I want to see it. I want to, you know, if, until you can actually see the data in Kafka, it, people actually think, think about it like a database and tables and rows. You need to see this, this data. And having end-to-end -end data management platforms that actually allows you to see the source the you know uh, downstream storage for analytics or for search or whatever your, your use case is and the streams in between and the topologies that we talked about today uh, there's a need for that we i can mention one tool we we are using uh, at babylon called lensis and they basically are providing the same same kind of solution we talked about today but with a nice ui that allows you to actually go and see your data and uh, and also manage your cluster by the way and those platforms i i see uh, you know a big demand for, for those all deployed on kubernetes francesco do you have a, do you see some something else coming in 2021 so i don't really feel comfortable in predicting something but what i can say is that i i saw for the first time kubernetes uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, two and a half years ago, more or less. So today at Nutmeg, we are uh, migrating all our um, all our platform towards Kubernetes. And what I what I notice is that Kubernetes is an amazing ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of uh, tooling. So it's not just Kube. There is a, an amazing community community around it different uh, solution, open source solution that you can, you can leverage. And what, what I hope is that this thing will not stop, but it, it will actually become even, even, even stronger because it really help us focusing on the, on the business value instead of reinventing something that other companies may, may need as, as well. All right, very, very good. Well, that's perfect. I think that was a very complete talk. Thank you so much for putting all the time and effort into preparing that. As I said, you can find both uh, Jeremy and Francesco in LinkedIn, but obviously in our, in our Slack as well. I invite all of you to, to get on our Slack to, to meet all the different people that we're interacting with. Um, also, I left a link for, uh, for their blog on Medium called Data Rocks. Please take a look at it. It's very, very good, very informative. A lot of stuff that we talked about today is featured in there and plenty of other things as well from, from a lot of folks that, that are involved in that. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time. And like I said, your effort and dedication, Jeremy and Francesco. Uh, any final thoughts, statements you'd like to share? Yes. We are hiring. If you're interested, get in touch. You have all my contacts there. Perfect. Clear message from Nutmeg. They are definitely hiring. And Francesco seems like a really cool person to work with, with a lot of cool things going on. Jeremy, are you hiring? I think we are hiring. And uh, yeah, Francesco is a very cool person to, to work with. So <laughs> make sure, you know, it's your choice. That's a, that's a wonderful recommendation inside a statement. <laughs> anyway. Same for Jeremy. Yes. Okay. So once again, we'll leave it at that. The final statement, Nutmeg is definitely hiring and Jeremy is supporting them as well. Um, so anyway, last thing that we want to do, uh, can we, uh, David, please compartir la batalla? Uh, we just want to share a screen. I hope you can all see my screen. While you've been talking, our, our friend Angel has been uh, doing some graphic recording, creating a visual depiction of all the things that we've been talking about. It's something we like to do because we talk about so many things just in a, in a short period of time. It's nice to visually see where we've kind of started and the things that have been mentioned along the way and where we finished. Um, so we'll be sending that to you, uh, Jeremy and Francesco as well. Um, so once again- Super cool. Yeah, yeah that's good. awesome. Good, good, good. Angel, uh, he's an expert, he's a pro. So Angel, he always has his microphone turned off. Thank you very much, Angel. Um, and anyway, so we'll be sending that to you, to UC. We'll also share it in our Slack and on LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. So everybody can check it out. And we'll be releasing the video um, probably by tomorrow. So you can look for that as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Take care. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.